Now turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, we left off in verse number 8 where he says, we are, after telling us that we walk by faith, that was our study of last week, and not by sight like Israel, Paul says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather, speaking of Paul and his ministers who are suffering for the Lord, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's Charlene. That's Charlene, isn't it? Amen. Mm -hmm. And she was looking forward to that because of the, 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 the uh, infirmities of her, of her body in, in, in her 90s. That was, that was her hope. I'm going to join her. Doty at the rapture, at the resurrection. I pray the Lord, no, we have to all go together here. Yes. You're 87, but I said you can't even say that until you're 90. Okay. So you got three years, okay? The Lord tarries three years. Then after 90, when you hit 90, then you can talk about it, okay? All right. All right, Doty. Where are we at? Okay, so, so Paul says, well, let's give the Lord thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this, this word today. We thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for, Sister Lori, that we can be of comfort to her and that through your divine providence um, you had sister Jerry Lynn not only come uh, all these all these uh, hours away to fellowship with us but she was able to be a vessel of honor to you and to mm -hmm. and comfort uh, to uh, sister Lori and we appreciate uh, their fellowship in the Lord you came through time you came through for her and you and as Paul says we know that you get, will yet come through for us father when we uh, uh, ask you to supply our, for our needs. So we thank you for that, Father. We ask as we have this study today, uh, you give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom. And like that song, give us a great appreciation of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and what he accomplished on Calvary for us. We thank you in his wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Notice here, Paul says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. The Apostle Paul had the hope that he knew that life after this life was much more glorious. Paul was willing to stick here to minister to others for the glory of God. That's why we exist. We exist to live for the glory of God. But notice in verse 8, he says, we're willing rather. If we, uh, my, my little daughter's here, and she, 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 she's that generation, that YouTube generation, they do these pranks and ask these questions and the games, and there's a would you rather game. And would you rather, they give you a couple of options. They'll say, would you rather, she, she once asked Chris and I, she said something like, would, um, uh, some type of, it was, it was uh, would you rather uh, burn in a fire or, you know, some, no, I know what it was. Would you rather uh, be in the de a hot desert or something or in the cold Arctic or something, kind of those extremes. Now, Chris and I, we remember what the cold weather was like in Illinois and Minnesota. We don't ever want to deal with ice cold weather anymore, right? So we might have chosen the desert part, the hot, the heat, because we don't mind dry heat. We went to we went to uh, Arizona on our honeymoon, July. We went in July, July 16, and we were out there playing tennis 14 years ago. And the people walking by said, "We know y'all not from here, because nobody in Arizona plays tennis in 110 degrees. We like we just happy to be here, you know. So we picked that. But this would you rather game." They, they ask you, which one would you rather? Be, they give you two hard choices. Well, here, this wasn't a tough choice for the Apostle Paul, okay? Um, he was, he was, he's more confident. Notice in verse 8, he says, we are confident, he and his, his, his companions, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Dodie mentioned how Sister Charlene, that was how she felt before she went and, 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 and beat us to glory. She's with the Lord uh, as of a month or so. So the point is, um, Paul says, that's where our hearts desire to be. Go over to Philippians, if you will. Go over to uh, Philippians chapter 1. Notice what Paul says here. Now, if he feels that way in 2 Corinthians, which is an early epistle, imagine where his heart was years later when he writes a latter epistle, which is Philippians, Okay. And if you look at Philippians chapter 1, verse number uh, 20. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. Notice what Paul says, according to my earnest expectation. 
Earnest means this is a strong desire he has. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, Paul is looking forward to something. He says that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Remember, he was suffering in imprisonment at this time. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ. And when he, he didn't say Jesus, he didn't say the Lord. He says Christ because he's looking at his sufferings and the glory that shall be revealed. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Amen. See, Paul is still talking about his physical body, just like in 2 Corinthians. Notice, whether it be by life or by death. Now, we understand how Christ could be magnified in his body through life. Paul could minister the word, right? But how can he be magnified by death? Because the death that Paul died would die would be for the Lord Jesus Christ. He would die as a martyr. You heard that word martyr, right? People talk about Stephen, the first martyr, and all this stuff. Well, God has had martyrs all the way back to the beginning. The first martyr actually was uh, uh, Abel. Cain killed his brother because his brother was righteous. Now, when people say uh, Stephen was the first martyr, they're talking about in the book of Acts and stuff like that. But really, Paul would be a martyr, and his death would be attributed for his faithfulness in Christ, his suffering. And so Paul says, listen, if I live, it's Christ. Well, I, you know what? I, was, I don't even have to say it. It's in my mind what he's saying here, but the next verse says it. Look at verse 21. So I'll, let, I'll just let the word say it. Say it. For to me, for, ex, further explanation, for to me to live is what? Christ and to die is gain. How can death be a gain? We spend our lives as humanity trying to avoid death. The blessed hope. I know exactly. It's the blessed hope. We have a hope that the lost person don't doesn't have. That's right. See, the lost person doesn't know for sure what's going to happen. They don't know for sure that if there's an afterlife, and if it is, what's going to happen? Where are they going to go? What's going to happen? And they try to avoid death. We, we grace believers don't have to try to avoid that. We, we, we want to live. Paul, God wants us to be living sacrifices, but we don't have to fear death. In fact, read that verse again. Verse 21, for to me to live is Christ. I'm going to live for the Lord and to die is gain. We're, we're, we're willing rather to be absent from the body present with the Lord. For, for us grace believers, you know what the problem is? It's that we want to go be with the Lord so bad. Don't be sitting there talking about Charlene beat me. <laughs> and I, I want to meet her there. You know? Oh, Snoop Dogg, you got a saying. He says, don't, don't meet me there, beat me there. That's his, that's his saying. Well, listen, Charlene beat us there, and we're going to meet her there in the air. Amen. But God wants us to have that earnest expectation to be with him, but also temper it by saying we're here to serve him, right? For to me to live is Christ. So if you're going to live here, serve him. Right. Let, uh, remind me second the end of Second Corinthians five there because it's a good passage about that. And look at verse twenty two, Philippians one twenty two. But if I live in the flesh, this is my this is the fruit of my labor. Paul's going to talk about labor later in Second Corinthians in this passage. He talks about this is the fruit of my labor. What is that? Well, you're going to see. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. What means I don't know what to choose. Verse twenty three. For I am in a straits betwixt two. You know, earlier I said it wasn't a difficult decision for Paul to want to go be with the Lord. He was willing rather. But what it made it so difficult on the back end is he knew he was supposed to serve the Lord by serving people. Notice, he said, for I, verse 23, for I am in a straight between two, having a desire to depart. By the way, when Paul talks about death, he always talks about a departure. He says, 2 Timothy 4, the time of my departure is at hand. Paul looked at it like a flight taking off. He says, I'm going to depart. Notice, the time of my departure. He talks about desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is what? Far better. It's far better to leave this world and be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But why, why, does, he leave, why does he leave us here? Look at the rest of that. Verse 24, uh, Philippians 1, 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, that's his body, is more needful for who? For you. Why did Paul choose to stay in his body, the earthly house of his tabernacle, so he might serve others? He did it for us. Why should we choose to stay here if that's possible? So that we might use the days to serve others. You know, 
God wants you to say, thank you, Lord, for this life. Thank you for your mercy. I live because of your mercy, and I'm going to use this life to serve you. Yes. Watch this. Look at this. Jody, we talk about this all the time. That's what you do. That's right. Jody was telling me earlier, she says how she was speaking to this gentleman, and she didn't want to presume on it. She says, Lord, I want it to be of you. And so the guy comes up to her and wants to talk to her. Yeah. You can't, get a, a, you can't, you can't, can't see a, a greater... Uh, a, uh, thing about God's providence, you're, you're saying, Lord, I want it to be this organic thing of you, and the guy comes up to talk to you, right. and so you can now be the vessel of the Lord. Look what Paul says here, verse 25, and having this confidence, same word he used back in 2 Corinthians, by the way, I know that I shall abide and continue with you. That's some confidence. You're saying, as long as God and I have, 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 have this pact that, okay, Lord, I'm going to serve you, nothing's going to happen to me until my, my, my until my, uh, how does Paul say it over here uh, in 2 Timothy 4? He says, um, I, he, he's fulfilled his course, right? He fulfilled his course. Until you fulfill your course and finish your course, that's right, and kept the faith, right? Until you finish your course, you're going to stay alive to finish your course. Notice here, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, with you all. How, why? For your furtherance. Amen. God wants them to go further in their in their in their life in Christ. By the way, that furtherance has to do with the judgment seat of Christ, everybody. Every day we live serving the Lord, it's fruit abound into our account. See? It's an account. And if God gives you time, Paul says redeeming the time. Redeeming is like to buy back that time, right? Uh, I'm not into stocks, bonds, all this stuff. But you can redeem certain things. Or if you have shares in, in a company, you can redeem them and so forth. Or they can redeem them. They can buy them back. The point is, that furtherance has to do with you getting more of a reward at the judgment seat. I'm going to show you that. He's going to say it in 2 Corinthians. Here we go. Verse 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. Well, that's some confidence. Paul was like, nothing's going to happen to me while I'm serving the Lord. My life is in his hands. Yeah. I Do you know the longer I'm in ministry, every day I know that? God's mercy is so wonderful that even if you are, are sabotaging your own life, <laughs> you, you're going to be in the state of... I can t look what happened to Jonah. God gave Jonah a directive, a command, and Jonah says, I'm not doing it. God says, yes, you are. <laughs> Jonah... Jonah died in the well. The well's in the water. The well is huge. There's water down there. He was choking on the waters and stuff. And God got that well. J Jonah's in the middle of the, of, the, of the sea. The well is what he was in a ship. That's how he got out there. The well swallowed him. God used the well, the first creature named by name in Genesis. The only animal named by name in Genesis is a well because God is preparing this well to get Jonah. Who's talking to the Lord Jesus? He died. And he spit him, out. spit him out on land. And God says, now are you ready? Yes, Lord, here I go. <laughs> I mean, the man died. He says, oh. And how do we know it's the type of the Lord? The Lord says, as Jonah was in the well's belly three days and three nights. Now we know how long Jonah was there. Uh, the, he says, the, the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Resurrection. And boom, he rose. He rose. And he continued the ministry. Look at it. Paul says, verse 25, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Amen. He's trying to get them to gain reward. What's the joy of faith? What does your faith produce? Glory. Amen. When you have faith in what God says, it brings forth fruit to your account. Verse 26, look what he says, that your rejoicing that, that, that word joy and rejoicing is associated with the reward of the inheritance. Look, that your rejoicing may be more abundant. More abundant. In Jesus Christ. See, that's where it's at for me by my coming to you. Paul is in prison. And he's saying, not only am I going to stay alive, these, these, these darn Romans won't kill me. God won't let, let it happen at this time. He says, I'm going to get out of prison and come to you. And he wasn't in just any prison. If you read the end of Philippians chapter 4, he's in Caesar's palace. 
Caesar's Palace is not a, a place in uh, the Las Vegas uh, strip. That's not Caesar's Palace. This was Caesar's Palace in Rome. And so it's this, it's this confidence that he is going to continue to serve the Lord. But even with that confidence, notice what Paul says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather, verse number eight, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's the natural uh, desire for a faithful saint. If you understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is as you study the word, it would be weird if you didn't want to go be with him. Right. See, see, lost people, they want to avoid the Lord Jesus Christ. They're like Adam and Eve in the garden. Every day they were meeting with the Lord, meeting with the Lord. They eat of the fruit. All of a sudden, the Lord is looking for them. They're hiding in the trees. The, the, he comes looking for them. They hide. If you're lost, you have the shame before God. You're going to try to avoid God. You make up stuff like if he doesn't like he doesn't exist, or you make you just make up you know stupid things like the theory of evolution, trying to get out of it. And the thing is, you can't avoid God. You can pretend like he don't exist, but there's a judgment coming. We're going to talk about in this study, because notice what he says here. Wherefore we uh, verse number eight, we are confident I say as a believer and willing rather be absent from the body. That's this physical earthly house of this tabernacle, and to be present with the Lord. By the way, that tells you there's no such thing as soul sleep. To be, that is that current, present, you're alive, you're there. You, you, you're alive with the Lord. Now, remember what I said. When Paul calls Jesus Lord, you want to train your mind to do this. I've, I've done that myself over these years. Right. Is that the, that's right, righteous judge. When he calls him Lord, that word Lord means the, and when it comes to the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, let me put his name on that. That's his, by the way, that's, that's his title right there. This is who he is. We don't call him Jesus, except when Paul calls him Jesus, talking about his physical human body. Uh, we call him the Lord Jesus Christ. You give him his due. Just like any Judge, if you went into a courtroom today, just any little Sacramento courtroom, you couldn't say to the judge, what's up, my man? What's going on? You know what they would say. You better address this court as your honor. <coughs> and, and, and you know what they would do if you didn't? They would hold you into contempt of court, have bailiffs put him in, put him in Sacramento County Jail until he's ready to address me as your honor. You be in jail, but, but I'm, oh, your honor, your honor, <laughs> like I was saying, your honor, um, that, that was hard. Yeah, call. all because you didn't use the right title. If that's the honor that some unrighteous, unjust judge in this world desires, uh, 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 must have, you know, that, that, that reverence, how much more the righteous judge, the Lord Jesus Christ? He earned that. We're going to see that in a minute. Notice here in verse number 8, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. Now, Paul knows that by saying you want to be present with the Lord in his presence, that there's some judge judgment. There's some judge... Uh, you know what? Oh, sorry. I erased part of my gene. There's some judgment coming, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about. Because the title is accepted there. Look, look what I want you to see here. Um, in verse 9, if you're going to be in the presence of a righteous judge, he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ here in a minute. Now, I'm going to do something. I've never taught one verse and then backed up to teach the preceding verses. I normally teach it as the verses come. But I wanted to talk to you about something called the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, look at verse 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present with them or absent, that means you're here, we may be accepted of him. Now, as you can see, what's my title, accepted of him? But I'm not going to teach about that or even labor. I'm going I'm to hold that off. I want to show you one thing first. You'll see why I want to do this. I want to show you why we desire, why we, why we want to be accepted of him, why we labor and serve him. 
Because look at the next verse. Look at verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must, what's that next word? All. All. By the way, that includes everyone here, everyone listening to Facebook, everyone who watch this on YouTube. That means everyone, every person ever born has ever lived on this earth. Now, in context, this judgment seat of judgment seat of Christ we're about to look at is only for believers in the body of Christ. So I'm going to keep it in context, but I'm saying everybody's going to be before the Lord Jesus. I'm going to show you that. Let's look at verse 10. For we must all appear. That appear means to make manifest. He's going to take us and make manifest what's in us. Watch this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to or in line with that he hath done, whether it be what? Good or bad. I've seen ministers in the so-called grace message, dispensationalism, go, they don't understand the judgment seat, so they'll say, Oh, this thing done in your body. See, they they say, well, this is the stuff that Christ brought in you. Now, they're partly right. The good stuff is what the Lord Jesus Christ works in us. But the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't work bad in us. This is our labor. Look at verse 9. When I say our labor, this this is what we allow him to do in us. And if, 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 if bad is wrought, that's not the Lord Jesus. The flesh. It's the flesh. I'm going to show you that. Uh, let me write down Galatians chapter 2. And, and Brother Ryan, before you go in there, uh, yes, go ahead. That bad, where does Satan play a part in the bad? And how much He's the one who his... tempts you. Mm-hmm. He's the tempter. He can't make you do anything. He tempts you. Tempts you. As the God of this world, little g, Satan has set up the course of this world to tempt you to disobey God, right? So he just puts it out there. He's the tempter. Call, call, call the tempter. He can't force you to do anything. If Satan could control us, we wouldn't be grace believers today, right? He's very, if, subtle. He's very subtle. But what's our protection? The word of God. How does any of us know how Satan works? Because God told us how he works. How Satan works mainly is he has set the course of this world as the God of this world, little g, 2 Corinthians 4. And he put things out there to tempt us to go against God. For example, Craig, how does Satan tempt our parents, Adam and Eve? God gave his word. Satan comes and says, yea, hath God said, right? And he tempts Eve, our mother, with the fruit of the tree that God forbid, right? Forbidden fruit. Mm -hmm. He didn't take her hand, put it up there, squeeze, get it, and then pop it in. No. He just said, he, he gave words. So religious words is another way he tempts. But he, he sets up the conditions on this earth to tempt you. That's all he can do. He does it through religion, and he does it through... So, so, so check this out, Craig. You have the two extremes of the flesh, right? Mm-hmm. And Satan knows all of us. So you have the lasciviousness side. Um, lasciviousness. Our weakness is also... Yeah, he, he, he uses it. He preys on our weaknesses with these things, don't he? And you have the religion side. Religion. So let's say you are a nice person in your own thing. You know, you think you're nice. You, you're on the religious side, right? And you say, I'm a good person. I do all types of good deeds. I help people. I ain't killed nobody yet. <laughs> yet. Because anybody can be pushed to murder. I'll tell you that. I'm a good person compared to whoever you're comparing yourself to. That's your flesh. Satan says, yeah, you so good. That's called pride. I'm so good. God says, no, you're not. Well, let's say you're not a religious person. You don't, you don't I'm worry about the religion. Then he gives you this lascivious carnal life, right? He gives you the, 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 the all the wonderful, tempting things of the world. And he says, hey. Forget that religion. Forget all that talk about God and Jesus. Get over here. Have fun. You what's that? YOLO. You only live once, man. Hey. You know, all that type of stuff. And you just foolishness. But this is the flesh too. So Satan, 
He'll give you anything and everything that you need. He, he'll, he'll tempt you with anything and everything. And your only protection is the word of God. Look what he says here. Verse number 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And it's called of Christ, and I'm going I'm to let you see that for a reason. And what he's going to do? That everyone, now every, I want to tell you guys, these are just people who are saved today. There's other judgments for lost people. There's other judgments for the nation of Israel. The judgment seat of Christ is only for the church, which is the body of Christ. The only people who will appear before the judgment seat of Christ are saved people in the dispensation of grace. The saved, the people who trusted Christ as their Savior. Uh, your lost family members who are left behind, they're not going to be before the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to be before the great white throne judgment. I'll talk about that later. But when it comes to us, the believer, if you're saved, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that, here's the purpose, everyone, that's every individual. People ask me all the time, Brother Ron, is this going to be some uh, large group judgment? You know, you, you get like uh, four or five guys, you see them in the court, they all in, in handcuffed and they committed the same crime. So sometimes they just do a, a, a group thing and so say, you know what, we, we're going to charge all five of them with the same crime and we just go. But a good attorney would say, hold on. My guy, he didn't pull the trigger. Yes, he was in the car. He was driving. But we we got, I got his text that says, hey, man, nothing about we're going to rob somebody or shoot somebody. It says we were going to pick up some weed. That's all. My, my guy was just like, I'm going to get the weed. A good attorney would do that. He says, I want to try my guy, my client separately from these fools. He's the shooter. They knew about it. Look at their text. They said, we're going to rob this. My guy don't know nothing about no. I did a case like that. I did a case like that. In Minnesota, I was uh, on the jury. I was the foreman. And the case was about a drug dealer. He just was in a, living in the house where the drugs were stored. He didn't smell. <laughs> yes, he couldn't smell that. He couldn't smell. They got bags of, bags of marijuana in the closet. His, his, his attorney said, it was scales. It was scales. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I see in the pictures. So it was black, hefty bags of marijuana all around the house. Scales everywhere. Like in the kitchen, you know, that you measured up. The attorney said, my client didn't know his boys were doing that. <laughs> he didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, he didn't smell it. He didn't see the scale. He didn't have people coming in and out. Nothing, nothing right? <clears throat> he was just an innocent victim of his friends. That, I mean, the attorney said that. I give the attorney credit because he was like, trying to get this guy off. It didn't work. We got him for a lesser charge. Because none of us could believe you're in a house with marijuana and scales and you, what? Somebody selling weed? <laughs> Come on, man. It was a funny case. Oh, 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 Monday, you better. I was you know. Anyway, the point is, if you got a group of people, you want to separate your driver if he didn't know. He wasn't in on the conspiracy to, uh, to rob, which robbery always certainly leads to murder eventually. Mm -hmm. If you go in there and try to rob, eventually it's going to lead. Just watch verse 48. There's always a drug robbery and it ends up somebody getting murdered because that's the next step. Well, we're going to each have our individual case because, look, I don't want to be associated with some fools in the body of Christ. I don't. That's why it's good that we all appear. So, no, when people ask me, Ron, is it going to just be a one judgment of all the people at the same time? I say, nope, mm-mm. It's going to be each and every individual in here. Listen to here. If you're saved, everybody else is going to be on the side, and you're going to come into the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow your knee. He's going to say, stand up. Here we go. And I'm going to show you what he's going to judge you on so you can be prepared for it. Our 10 minutes in the Word, Brother King David sings, to prepare you for the judgment seat of Christ. That's our ministry. Because notice, you want, to receive, you want Christ to give you for good and not bad. So we're going to learn how that when we stand before the Lord, how he's going to reward us good and not bad. Look at this verse. Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That. Here's the purpose. Everyone. And I like he says one. He's going to do it. One by one. 
may receive, he's going to give us something, the things done in his body. What are you doing? Why did God leave you here? He wants you to serve him. I'm going to show you how to serve him to get your full reward. Notice, according to that he hath done. This, this is where your works come in. Um, people are confused by religion. Because religion says you must do works. Let me put that religion up there again. Religion. Re. Religion. That means ligament to bind. You have ligaments binding your, your uh, body together to bind. Re is again. Refresh. That means again. And religion wants you to bind yourself again to God. God had enough of that with Israel for 1,500 years. He says, you can't do it to please me. So God says, here's what I'm going to do with your religion. And then through the blood of Christ, who kept the law perfectly, the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood on the cross, he died for you, okay? He did it. He did it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. So now God can be God's riches at Christ's expense. And what that ends up being is the grace of God. And God's grace says, I will freely, it was a free gift of salvation. Because Jesus paid it full and free. So now you don't have to bind yourself to God through religious works, uh, going to church, going to confession, uh, uh, mass, praying five times a day towards me, all this re religious stuff, alms. And you get free gift of salvation through the grace of God because of what Christ did. Now, that means no works to be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, let's go there. Go to Ephesians 2. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me show you something. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Craig, you asked earlier how does Satan work to interfere? If you if you have this religious bent to you, right? He loves that. Whether it's Catholicism, Islam, if you name the religion, these Eastern religions, Buddhism, Taoism. All that religion. They all have one thing in common. It's the focus is on you doing something to, to the higher being or to the chief, to the higher power, and then mm -hmm. all this nonsense. It's all nonsense. Listen, or to appease some gods. God's grace says, God's word says, faith. Faith is taking God at his word. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. What was our study last week? By faith. It is impossible to please God if you don't do it by faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Everybody get it. Ephesians 2, 8. For by what? Grace. Look at this. Grace is God, rich is Christ, but it's unmerited. Favor. Undeserved. Kindness. Listen, God is being kind and, and 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 favorable to us, not based upon what we do, on but what on his what his son the Lord Jesus Christ did at Calvary. Unmerited means you 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 can't earn it and you don't deserve it. Unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. Look what he says of right here, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through what? Amen. Trust what God said. Stop trusting yourself. And that, well, it's in the verse. And that not of what? 
yourselves. It's not of yourselves. What is it? Verse 8. It is the what of God? The gift of God. He gives it to you. One thing when you have a child, our daughter just turned nine years old on the 16th. She's been talking about that birthday since uh, May 17th of last year. She's been looking forward to this one. And all she's talking about is all the gifts she's going to get, baby. Grandma, Grandpa, Nana, Papa, we're getting them all. You don't know who's doing that. <coughs> Your child, you're looking for gifts. <laughs> Christmas comes around. Well, now her big thing is just get her a Visa gift card. She go buy all this stuff. <laughs> we were somebody gave her one. We were targeting her something. She's like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna ask for Visa gift cards because <laughs> I can get me whatever." And I said, "Boy, she own it now, huh? She's turning ten next year, so y'all double digits, you know. <laughs> so get those gift cards ready, big grandparents, no Nana, problem. Papa, we all no All right, Visa gift card because then she can go anywhere. It's free gift now. Watch what it says. It is a gift of God. And then, just so you not confused, look at verse 9, Ephesians 2, 9. Not of what? Works. Works. So you can't tell everybody all the stuff you're doing to please God. Well, I tithe this, and I go to church, and I do confession, I go to mass, I do all my prayers. I'm going to show you a verse where Paul says that every mouth may be stopped. Watch this. Not of works, verse 9, lest any man should what? Boast. Boast. See, God made it that nobody can say, look at what I've done. Look how good I am. Look. No, no, no. Hold your hand there. We're going to come back to verse 10. Go over to Romans 3. See, God wants us to shut our mouths when it comes to what we did. Because it's not about us. It's about him. The Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Notice, accepted of him. He's the judge. He's the righteous judge. Notice what he says in Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 19. It's so funny when they talk about doing charitable <coughs> things. You know, in the grace message, I can see this stuff spiritually. People say, Oh, I felt so good when I went and gave at that charity. It made me feel so good. Listen, God don't want you feeling so good about your giving because he didn't tell you to do that. Should we be charitable to people? Yes. But we ought to give God the glory. Somebody said, Brother Ron, oh, I enjoyed that message you told me. I say, praise the Lord. I'm just, it's just my natural response because I know it's not me, the man. I'm just the human vessel. You give glory and praise and honor to God. Holy and reverent is his name. Don't call anybody a reverend. Listen, the Bible says holy and reverent is his name. And by putting the title reverend on some religious dude, that is dishonoring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy and reverend is his name. <laughs> See, but you, you wouldn't know that if you don't know the Bible. Look at this. In verse 19, Romans 3, now we know that what things soever the law saith, that's that law of Moses that was in the earth in Paul's day, it saith to them who are under the law. Israel would look at those condemning verses of judgment and say, yeah, get them dudes over there, Lord. Get those heathen Gentiles. And then Paul is sent by God and says, yeah, it was talking about the heathen Gentiles, but it's talking about you too. Watch this. Verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth might be what? Stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Do you know if God asks you questions about what you're doing right now, every word you say you'd be condemning yourself in his, in his presence. Look at the court of law. When, if, you're, if you're even arrested, forget the court. If the police arrest you in this country, they got Miranda rights. And they say, whatever you say can be used against you in a court of law. Judges will tell you if you think you're going to represent yourself in a criminal matter. That's different than civil. Criminal matter. The judge will say, uh, before you say something, sir, Mr. Knight, I would advise you to get counsel because you're going to go on record. You're going to, they know you're going to say something incriminating. They know it. 
So you get a lawyer who can shift the little snaky guy who can get you out of it. That's what that. Listen, look what this says. Every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. You know what's crazy? At the great white throne, God is going to allow lost people to come and plead their case before him. Don't do it. I, I'm going to scream, don't do it. I'm going to be in the, the jury box and get, don't do that, man. Don't. Because look, let me tell you something. If you start talking to God about how righteous you are, you're going to condemn yourself. I'm going to tell you that. He's so holy. So just, you know what you do to God. You say, dear Lord, I just, I, 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 I just plead your mercy, please, Lord. Merciful God. You, you know he's mer just the only one. Merciful. That's how you go to God. You can appeal to his mercy, but don't come up there all self-righteous like you're going to tell God why it was a mistake that you went to hell. Uh-huh. All the world become guilty before God. Look at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law. Another word for law is this word right here. Religion. You can take the word law in these passages and content, and whatever the religion is, watch this. Therefore, to buy the deeds of whatever religion you think you good, you know, that you can use, there shall no flesh be justified in God's in his name. <clears throat> All religion is good for to tell you a sinner. That's it. That's it. Tell you you bad. You're so bad. Condemn you. Well, God had enough of that. So look, let's see what he did here. Verse number 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Let me, let me do it for you. Let me do it for you. Now the righteousness of God without religion is manifested. How? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That Old Testament of the Jews pointed to someone. Verse 22. Notice I said pointed to someone. Not something. Someone. That's right. Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God. In order to be right with God, you must have his righteousness. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, Brother Ron, how can I have the same righteousness God has? Well, it has to be given to you. It was, if you trust him. Notice. Look at this. Verse 21. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of who? Of who? Jesus Christ. See, his faith was perfect. His faith didn't fail like our faith. And so God the Father accepts his son's faithfulness and says, anyone, let us look at the verse. That I want you to have faith in God's word. That's why most churches, you don't even need a Bible. You just sit there like this. They put a movie on for you. <laughs> roll that, roll that. Okay. He's sleeping. Oh, is it over? Or he shouted at you, and God said, and then all this stuff, trying to get you all riled up. You don't need any of that. You just need your King James Bible. If you can speak English at a at the same level of a 12-year-old, like a sixth grade level, you can understand this book. And God won't even leave you to your own device. He'll give you a preacher. Watch this. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto who? Not just the Jews. Who? The Jews and Jews. All. And upon all them that do what? Believe. You have to believe in Jesus and what he did on the cross. And when you and I believe and trust our Lord Jesus Christ, what he did at Calvary, God will give us his righteousness. Notice this. Yes. His righteousness. Notice. For there is no difference. For all have sinned, not fall short, and come short of what? The glory of God. And you know what glory of God is manifested in the Bible? His goodness. People say God is good, and then they say all the time, that's right. He's, his goodness is beyond our human comprehension. You and I aren't good. Remember, that's why I said earlier, the moment you say how good of a person you are, just drop to your face like David and say, I'm sorry, Lord, for saying that. I don't care if you're the best person. I don't know a person on this earth better than Christian. I don't know any, I've never, in my 45 years on, in, on earth, never ran into a person. Not just because she's my wife. Even if she wasn't my wife. She could be somebody else's wife. I never ran into a person better. And Christian will tell you, don't ever compare me to, to the Lord in any way besides I'm in him. And I'm thankful for his, for his grace. 
God's goodness is, is beyond what you can even... The moment we start talking about how good we are, you'll be condemned by Almighty God's holiness, okay? So let's accept it from him. Look, look verse 24. Being justified. That means be, being righteous. Being justified how? Freely. You see why I put free gift up there? Because it's free. You don't have to pay for it. It's paid for by the blood of Christ. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is where? In Christ. In Christ. And when he says in Christ Jesus, he's talking about he, he, he suffered on the cross. He died. He sacrificed. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Now with all that said about how you get saved, there's no works, unmerited favor, undeserved kindness, does that mean God doesn't want us to do good works? That's after salvation. That's, after salvation. Yeah, that's right. It's after salvation. Because God does want us to do good works. Because hey, there's a judgment seat of Christ coming. And what did that verse say? At the judgment seat of Christ, he's going, we're going to receive... Did I spell receive I before E except that C? <laughs> Did I do it right? C -I, yeah. C -I. Well, see, I remember six of, what was that, second grade, I before E. Do you know I before E except that C? Yes. And when you're yes. what? Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes. I know English is confusing. <laughs> well, I don't get why they Oh, we won't go into that right now, but we, my daughter's about to break down in the English language on us. <laughs> Third grade English. I have trouble with that word. I know. I got I to gotta say, I before E except that to C. All right. So we're going to receive for our good and bad. Okay. That's. Because of that bad there, that tells you this is not just what Jesus wrought in a person. Burned up. This is what Jesus wrought, but that's what we, our flesh wrought that. That's what we burned up. That's right, Dodie. Part of our in there. Now watch this. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 now. I asked the dear sister in the Lord once. She'd been in grace message longer than me. And uh, she didn't know this verse by heart. And that was a shame because she was. We were talking about these things. If you don't know Ephesians two, ten, a lot of people know Ephesians two eight. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You should know verse ten too, because good works are important. And the reason I was I brought her up is because of this. We were teaching on good works and how that affects your reward. And she was, saying, but, but we're saved by grace. I said yes. Sister, we're saved by grace, but also, do you know the next verse? What do you mean? Ephesians 2.10. Um, is it? No. I got you. For we are, let's see a singer for you. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Listen, God created the body of Christ to perform good works. And we have a series on that in our YouTube. So if you missed that, I did like a four-part four series. Good works. So do our works matter to God? Yes. For salvation? No. no. But for our service and our reward? Our walk. Yes. Right. Because good works it is our walk, right? A walk of good work. Walk by faith. But it affects our reward. See? At the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in the time we have left... <clears throat> Paul only mentions the judgment seat of Christ twice. But the, but, the, but the issue of the judgment seat of Christ in Paul's epistles is everywhere. Let's look at the second time he mentions, or the first time actually in the book of Romans. Um, the term judgment seat of Christ. Go to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. Now, judgment seat of Christ. Paul only mentions it like that two times in his epistles. Uh, the, our, our passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 and Romans chapter 4 10, 14 verse 10. Now look what they have in common. Both of them are verse 10. This term judgment seat of Christ is mentioned this many times in scripture. And the more you study the Bible about the judgments, like the Ten Commandments, the judgment, then the, if you like Bible numerics like I do, the number 10 is closely associated with judgment. 
Judgment seat of Christ is mentioned 10 times. I actually think the judgment seat of Christ for each and every one of us, how long it'll take, is 10 years. We'll be there. And on the earth, that's when the Antichrist and all the chaos, the Antichrist and all the chaos for peace in the Middle East. I went over that uh, last Sunday. Was it last Sunday or Wednesday? I was talking about... Uh, it was Wednesday, but I was talking about, oh, our Wednesday study was, what's going on over in the Middle East? We expound on that from Scripture. It's the mystery of iniquity working. But here's the point. As the Lord Jesus is with us for 10 years, I think it is, 10 is number two, the earth is going to go into all this chaos that you can see it happening over in the Middle East. And then the Antichrist is going to say, I gotta, I, I'm going to bring peace to the Middle East, and he's going to have a plan. They're going to rebuild the temple, give the Jews a temple on the Temple Mount. They're going to start to uh, offer sacrifice again. They're going to say, there's our Messiah. Until he's in like in the middle of it, he's just gonna start and say, "Yep, I'm the Messiah," and he's gonna stop the uh, the sacrifices and claim to be God. But that's all gonna happen in the future. Ten is the number. So, so Paul only mentions it twice. But let, let me let me show you his mention in, in Romans. We already saw the one in Second Corinthians, and then let's look at what the Bible says. What the judgment seat's gonna look like? Okay, look at Romans chapter fourteen. Romans chapter fourteen. Look at Romans chapter 14 and verse number 10. <clears throat> Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? And, and in context, it's in what he eats. Why are you worried about what somebody else eat or drink? You know what I'm Paul says, why do you care what they eat or what they drink? Who are, who are you to say you can't eat that or drink that? Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about. Watch this. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not? By the way, if you don't think people, you go to a religious place, you go to religion or denomination, and they'll say, you can't eat that. You can't drink that. But as soon as you walk through the door. You, they say, say, come on to our religious place. You walk through the door. Don't you be eating or drinking that stuff. Don't do it. You say, I just walked through the door. You think that's funny? Well, religion does that. Don't eat that. Don't drink that. Don't eat that. Paul says, but why does thou judge thy brother? Verse 10. Why does thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written. Now, when Paul quotes the Old Testament, we're going to go back and look at it in Isaiah in a moment. It is written. As I live, saith the Lord. That means the Lord Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead. Every knee shall bow to who? To him. And every tongue shall confess to God. By the way, he is God. He's the son of God. Verse 12, love this. So then every one of us, and he keeps saying every one of us, individual, shall give, what's that next word? Uh, account. You're going to settle your account of himself to God. Everybody listening is going to have a day where we all, one by one, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going we're gonna to have to give an account of our lives. So now that should make you say, well, how am I I've been living my life? Oh, boy. Well, the good news is God is merciful, and he's warning you now so you can say, hmm, Lord, I need to make sure I know how to walk with you. Well, good. I'm glad you want to do that. Because that's what our assembly is here for, to help you be prepared for the journey to the Christ. That's why I live. Listen, go over to Isaiah. Uh, go over to Isaiah chapter 45. Look at Isaiah 45. Paul is quoting the book of Isaiah, so we, we got to get back there and check it out. People say, Brother Ron, how do I read the Bible? I said, well, you read Paul's epistles. You learn those first, Romans through Philemon. Get, get, get a working knowledge of Romans through Philemon. And then you study it this way. Especially now you can have a study. Oh, I the internet now. You can, you can say, um, study verses for this verse or something. Or you just ask me how to do it if you hear it. Ask me. <laughs> and when Paul goes back to the Old, and quotes the Old Testament, he'll say, as it is written, then you can go back and look at that passage. It'll start to give you more understanding. That's how I started studying the Bible years ago. Watch this. Look what Paul says, uh, look what Isaiah says to Israel. Verse 22. 
Look at Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be saved. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting to be saved? You have to look unto him. Look unto the Lord Jesus. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the what? The earth. <clears throat> For I am God and there is what? None no. else. Listen. There's only one true and living God, and that's the God of crea the creator of God of the Bible. So because he's the greatest, the most high, notice what he says in verse 23. I have sworn by myself. You know, people swear to God. You walk in that courtroom, <laughs> put that hand up there, it says, put the left hand on that Bible, put the right hand up and say, so help you God, right? God looks around and says, I don't have nobody, I don't have nothing to swear, I just swear on myself. I swear by myself. He's trying to show you just how sincere he is about this promise. He goes, y'all swear to me, I'm going to swear by myself. Watch this. I have sworn, past this, I have sworn by myself, verse 23. The word is going out of my mouth in righteousness. And what happens, Dodie? When God sends that word out, what's the rest? Of it? it don't come back what? Void. That's right. When God says something, it's going to happen. So he says, the word has gone out of my mouth. It's out there now in righteousness and shall not return. And what's that word? Look at this. That unto me every knee shall what? Bow. Bow. Every tongue shall swear. Yes. Yeah, that's the confession. See, people are going to get up there and they're going to say, well, let me tell God something. God said, go ahead. <laughs> and their mouth, just like that movie with the, uh, what's his name, crazy dude from the office. Uh, what was his name? You know, yeah. and he was on that movie where his mouth, uh, the guy played God, got God's power, and the guy was trying to say one thing, but his tongue was saying something else. That was going to happen. You're just going to confess that Jesus. I'll tell you what they're going to confess in a moment. Watch it. Every time she'll swear. You want to see what they're going to do? Go over to Philippians chapter two. Uh, it was with Jim. It was the crazy dude we don't like. Jim crazy. Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey. Um, he played. It was called Bruce Almighty, and one of his uh, one of his uh, uh, workmates because he's on a newscast. This guy played Michael from The Office. What's his name? Oh, I forgot his name. But anyway, he was trying to say one thing, and Jim Carrey was making him say something else with God's powers. And that's how it's gonna be. You think you're gonna say something? God's gonna. Like, mm. If you are gonna talk, you're gonna confess. To, here's what you're gonna confess. Look at Philippians chapter two. Look at Philippians chapter two. Now that's going to be bothering you, girl. <laughs> Michael on the office. What's his name? It's, it's uh, Jim something right now. I forgot his name. Now, see, I shouldn't even brought him because that's going to be bothering my wife until she gets the name. Anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. We can talk later. Look at uh, chapter 2 of Philippians. Now, because of what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished at Calvary, because he sacrificed himself in obedience to God, He's going to be rewarded. What was it? Steve Carell. Steve Carell. That's my guy. I like it. Only an awesome, but nothing else. Right. Because of what the Lord Jesus did on the cross, notice what happens. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Start at verse 8. Get a little context. Philippians 2, verse 8. Speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Chris and I were talking about this passage. We were in this passage about four, it was about seven, eight years ago, maybe around. And Krista was thinking about this, and she added something to my understanding. She says, you know, even unto even the death of the cross, that is the death of the cross. And she was like, that, even, that issue of even the death of the cross, that cross wasn't the death he was prophesied to die. He was supposed to die a death on that altar in the temple. And they were to do it by faith, buying the sacrifice to the court, uh, by courts to the horns of the altar, Psalm 45, and he was supposed to die as the Messiah. But he died as a rejected curse. Yes, as a curse, and they put him on a tree. Curse of everyone hanging on a tree. And so she was right. Not only was he going to die for Israel, but he was supposed to die as the sacrifice like Abraham with Isaac. He died even a more 
despicable death. Like he did something that he wasn't even supposed to do. Right. Even the death, even that is the death of the cross. Mm -hmm. Not just any death, it was the death of the cross. And because of that faithfulness, notice what God the Father is going to do. Verse 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. See, because he humbled himself, God highly exalted. I'm going to show, I got a secret in the scriptures, guys, from the scriptures. The more you humble yourself, the higher God exalts you. That's the principle. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The more humble you are towards God, the more highly he's going to exalt you. That's the principle. God hates pride. The more proud you are, the greater the fall. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If you want to make sure you're going to fall, just keep being proud. But if you want to make sure you're highly exalted, humble yourself. Notice verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above what? Every, Every name. That at the name of Jesus. By the way, in the Bible, these names, that's a title. This is a job. These names are titles. And what the Lord Jesus Christ, what his title is, notice, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should, what? Bow. Of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, there's hell and, and, and so forth. Listen, and every tongue should confess. That's that swearing. Isaiah didn't finish it because Jesus had not appeared yet. But here it is. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The judge. The righteous judge to the glory of God the Father. Listen. Everybody someday is, someday is going to bow down to Jesus Christ, our Lord, yes. and confess that he's Lord. Amen. Everybody. I don't care what religion you're in. I don't care what your belief says. You're an atheist. With your atheistic tongue, you're going to bow down before Jesus Christ and say, you're Lord. Those that curse him today are going to bow down before him. Before we end, I, before we end, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me show you something about, about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was nice and meek and humble during his earthly ministry. He was loving, kind. That's not how he's going to be at this. He's going to always be there, let me say it like this. He's going to add something to that. He's, he's going to add some terror. The Bible talks about the terrible day of the Lord. It's not a bad thing as far as how we use terrible. It's like, you're going to be in terror if you are in the wrong. That's the point. Now, if, you, if, if you've been serving him, you're looking forward to it because he's going to bless you. We're going to end on a good note. But notice here, verse number 10 and 11, 2, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be what? Good or bad. Verse 11. Knowing therefore the what? Terror. The terror. <laughs> the terror of the Lord. I like to put the roar in there, like a roaring lion. Note, uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we, pers we persuade men. I bet you do. I bet you do. If you teach people really who they're going to come up against in that day, it should put fear in their hearts. I'm going to show you all this. I, ain't even going, I wasn't even going to go there, but I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 14, uh, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, watch this. Let's finish this verse, and then we'll look at a couple verses in the end. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God. I'll get into all that uh, next week. Get First Corinthians. Yeah, we're in Second Corinthians. Go to First Corinthians chapter fourteen. First Corinthians chapter fourteen. Oh yeah, this Acts. Acts. Is I just want to give y'all an example of how the Apostle Paul preached Jesus. He didn't preach it like this. Invite Jesus into your heart. 
because God has a wonderful plan for your life. Come to Jesus. Make him the Lord of your life. It wasn't this flowery. No, 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 no. Not the Apostle Paul. Listen, the Apostle Paul preached Jesus to these heathens like, eh, there's some terror coming. And you need to be saved from it. I'm going to show you that. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. The churches, even the weak churches of Corinthians, when people went in there, they heard the Spirit of God talking about the Lord Jesus. The Spirit. This is when the supernatural signs and wonders come. The Spirit would talk about Jesus. Watch, watch this. Watch this. The Lord Jesus. And watch what the man who listened to this would do. Watch this. Watch this. Verse number 24. Did I tell you chapter 14? Yes. Verse 24. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. Now what is he judged of? Watch the next part. Verse 25. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. He's finding out he's a sinner. And he's going to hear about the Lord Jesus to the point, look at the rest of this verse. And so falling down on his what? Face. Face. He will worship God and report that God is in your truth. Listen, those preaching sessions back there, wasn't this, oh, God has this wonderful plan. God has a plan for your life, and it's hell. And, and, and with the Spirit of God, he read their hearts right in front of everybody. Good thing, thank God he don't do that like that today, mm -hmm. supernatural, okay? <laughs> Although when you learn the word, you can sense, you know what's going on. But this man heard something that made him just drop to his face like this and say, yeah, have mercy, dear Lord. That wasn't some flowery message from a preacher. That was terrifying. You ever heard of fire and brimstone preaching? Mm -hmm. How they used to yeah, go ahead. Right, right. So they they hearing Paul preach, but they hearing no no no. This wasn't Paul himself. These were the Corinthian believer by the Spirit of God. This, but this is how Paul preached to people, mm -hmm. to lost people. But, and like this man who heard this, who is he hearing? Is he hearing the the, the Spirit? Spirit of God? Oh, okay, through men though. Okay, through so prophets. Said, okay, sorry about that. These these are prophets saying this. So so check this out, Craig. The Spirit of God is speaking through these men. And it's terrifying to this guy, and he just gets on his face. Yeah. One more example of that from a ruler that Paul was speaking to. Uh, go over to the book of Acts, if you will. Acts chapter, let's see, I think it's chapter 25. I think that's it. Oh, no, Acts chapter 24. Let's stand here. <coughs> see, people take the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was the lowly carpenter minister of Galilee, right, of, from Nazareth. No, no, no. He was that. He's not that now. He will. He will. That's right. What he is now is the righteous judge. Grace. That's great. That's it, though. But can I tell you something? I don't know who's been to a courtroom before. Even if it's a civil courtroom, it's kind of an ominous thing, right? You, you, you got the doors. You got the benches. Uh, you know, the, people, the seats. You got this. Oh, there's, the, there's the judge. There's the bench. Even before the judge gets out there. It's just like, it's, it's an uneasy feeling. I think God mm -hmm. wants that, especially if it's a criminal trial. You the criminal. <laughs> but imagine, it's like, you see that judge in his black robe. They, that's symbolic. They walk in there. All rise. And you rise. Okay, justice. You might be seated. So as soon as you know, they, they all business. I notice they don't have clocks in, in the courtrooms. You know why? It don't matter. They take all the time they need. And that judge, it could be the littlest judge, Judy. She got imposing, you know, on a little robe there. She's tiny. But it's something about a courtroom. Imagine, if that's how we feel in a courtroom with a little four foot ten woman with a black robe, imagine when the righteous judge, you walk into his courtroom. So much so that I'm going to show you that this was as a leader in the Roman Empire. Look at, uh, we're going to end in Acts chapter 24. Now this is Paul, uh, Brother Craig, this is Paul speaking to this man, okay? Mm -hmm. By the way, this man, civilly speaking, is over Paul. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a civil authority. He's a CA. Civil authority. Yet when Paul started talking to him, he didn't say, Dear Felix, invite Jesus into your heart. He has a beautiful plan for your life. Oh, no, I'm mm -hmm. Here come Felix, verse 24, Acts 24, 20. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he was a Gentile, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. 
Now look, Paul is speaking, he's preaching about faith in Christ. It wasn't flowery because when he preached faith in Christ, notice what happened in the next verse, look at verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and what to come? Judgment. Judgment to come. That tells you how to minister to people when you give them the gospel. Mm -hmm. What did Felix do? Tremble. Tremble. Hearing, hearing a preacher say, God has such a wonderful plan for your life. Would that make you tremble? Make you tremble? Uh -uh. What makes you tremble is you just preach them the way I just did. You show them the terror of the Lord. And God wants your little human heart to tremble. He wants our hearts to tremble before his son because his son died on the cross for us. He paid the price. He deserves it. He's worthy of the praise. He's worthy of the honor. And he is the Lord of all. And when you get finished with someone, they should be trembling, shaking because of the terror of the Lord. Now let's look at it. Uh, this is Paul speaking to the, to the man. And as he reasoned, verse 25, the righteous tempers and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered. Now, this, I love this. Watch this, watch this. He's frightened. He goes, um, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. <coughs> that dude is trying to get off of it like that big fish on that bass, that bass fish that Renee was trying to catch. Mm -hmm. He caught a big one, but that thing struggling. It's like, oh, oh, he got off. This guy's like, that's a little too much, man. I got to think about it. God give you space to repent. That's fine. You think that guy went home and, and, and sat with his little wife through cell and was like, oh, it was a good day. He's like, oh, Lord. She, she, she says, dear, did you hear what the man was saying? She says, I heard. I'm scared of the Lord Jesus, too. You need to be scared of the Lord Jesus. If you're lost, but also if you're saved and you're not serving him in the grace message, next week we're going to look at the passages on the judgment seat of Christ. Where are they all at? And what's going to happen there? I'm going to show you how at the end of that message, you can have great confidence like the Apostle Paul to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. I said I was going to preach it backwards, right? I, the first time I did that, I preached one verse, but I'm going to go back. Because when Paul says he's confident rather to be with the Lord, he's not saying, oh, I just want to be with the Lord. He's saying, I'm serving the Lord in righteousness, and I want my reward. And you and I can have that confidence. If you're not walking, pleasing to God, you should be afraid. But if you, through the grace message, knowing that you're walking, pleasing, that you're serving them. By the way, one of the good works is just you guys being here today. You're saying, God, my time is your time. And I just, I, you deserve, dear Lord, for me to come hear your holy word. That's a service to him. But it's a life of service, okay? Um, if you... Somebody said once about the press, the media. They are to afflict the, com the, the, afflict the comfortable. I think that's the same. Afflict, yes. Afflict the comfortable. You know, people high, high and mighty, right? Looking down their nose to you. And comfort the afflicted, the downtrodden of society and so forth who have been taken advantage of. But that's God's word. The word of God does that too. God's word has an ability, if you're too comfortable and fat in your own private, it afflicts you. It convicts you. It's supposed to. But also, God's word can if you're if you're down and trodden and you and you need you need that you need God's salvation, you need his love. His word comforts the afflicted too, uh, the afflicted. And so God has an ability through his word to do both. A preacher is to do both. We're to make you tremble in your heart if you feel like you're not right with God. But then we're to teach you how to be right with God. That's the point of preaching. That's why we have a local assembly. And I pray that through the spirit of God and his word, I can help you guys get the full reward. We'll talk more about the reward of the inheritance and the judgment seat, what it looks like, what, he, what he's going to judge us on, and all those <coughs> details next week, okay? Next Sunday. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you for...
his sacrifice, his suffering, his sacrifice, his passion to go through all of that pain that he endured on our behalf, particularly there at Calvary, Father. We thank you for his shed blood delivering us from religion and from the works of our own and that we can, in our hearts, trust him and him alone. But it's no mistake why you put these verses in the Bible about Felix trembling, the man at Corinth falling on his face to worship you. It's because there is a fear and a reverence we need to have of your son. He is the holy avenger, we'll find out next week. So Father, I pray that if there, there are those who haven't settled the issue of salvation listening, that the, the fear and terror of the Lord has come through. Not so that you might condemn them, but just convict them so that they might come to your loving son. Because although he is a terror, he's also a loving, merciful Savior. And that those hearts that are fearing can come and get peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, for those who are saved, may we be persuaded by the Apostle Paul that there are good works, that we are going to stand before his judgment seat and, and, and receive for the things that we've done, whether good or bad. Father, my prayer for, for, for this assembly is that we uh, learn how to produce the good, the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the praise and glory of you. May that be the goal of all of our lives, Father. And uh, we thank you we can come together with those of my precious faith. As we heard, uh, Sister Lori has no one else, and you still comfort her by her sister coming a nice long distance to, to, to just have a meal with her, which is so comforting. In the name of Christ. And thank you, Lord, for uh, faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May we do that one with another. We thank you for all this in Christ's name.